welcome to the Voice of Triumph. My name is Ukochukwe Bazo. It's a special Q&A online service, which is a quarterly service where we take questions from all aspects of life. So let's go right into the session today. We have quite a number of questions today, and I'm trusting God that they'll all be answered in this session. The first question says, does this COVID-19 pandemic reveal the end time? Does the pandemic reveal the end time? Now, let me begin by saying this, that there have been so many other pandemics in the past. We've had the um, um, Spanish flu, we had the Asian flu, we had the HIV AIDS, of course, pandemic that, that came up, that hit the world in 2000 and, uh, in, in 1981. And then we had the, the SARS, the Ebola, that again came out in 2014. And of course, the COVID-19, you know, a pandemic that we're dealing with today. Now, all of these are pointers to the fact that we're living in the, in the, in the last days. They are pointed to the fact that we are living in the end times. And you see that exactly by the, the, the statement that our Lord Jesus made in, in Matthew chapter 24. And I'm reading verses 3 to 8. Our Lord Jesus begins to reveal that part of the signs of the end times will be, you know, the, the epidemics. Praise God. Matthew 24 verses 3 and 8. And let's read quickly. And as Jesus sat upon the Mount Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take it that no man deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then he begins to say, The seven for nations will rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms, and there shall be famines and pestilence. Underline the word pestilence. And earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So Jesus says that pestilence will be one of the signs of the end times. And the things we're talking about here, the epidemic we're talking about here, is a pestilence. All the epidemics that the world has seen that I, I listed here are all you know, are pestilences that the world has seen. So the, another word for pestilence is actually epidemic. And I sought to know the, the dictionary meaning of the word pestilence. And um, the, the Webster Dictionary defines a pestilence as a contagious or infectious epidemic disease that is virulent or viral in nature. That's exactly what COVID-19 is. So Jesus says that, it, that the pestilence will be one of the signs of the end times. So is the, is the pandemic you know, revealing the end times? Yes. Is he one of the signs of the end times? Yes. Is he a pointer to the fact that we're living in the end times? Yes. But the question is, should we allow, because I noticed that every time we talk about the end times, people are afraid. Should, should this understanding inspire fear? No, it shouldn't. Rather, it should inspire purity. You know, our Lord Jesus said something in First John chapter 3, verse 3, that anyone who has this hope in themselves will purify themselves even as Jesus is pure himself, praise God. So this, this understanding, the, you know, the things that are happening in the world today shouldn't inspire fear. Rather, for believers, they should inspire purity and then an urgency to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, a commitment to soul winning. That's what it should do for us. It shouldn't um, make us afraid, praise God. So the answer is very simple. The pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic is a pointer to the end time. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now the second question says, and this is very interesting, it says, who inspired the killings in the Old Testament times? Who inspired the killings in the Old Testament times? Is it God, the devil, or man? Well, let me begin by saying that man couldn't have inspired any of the killings because man, you know, always acted on the inspiration of either God or the inspiration of the devil. So man couldn't have inspired any of the killings. The killings were either inspired by God himself, and that is strange, you know, and contrary to the belief that many of us have, or inspired by the devil himself. Now let's look at, you know, the different killings and, you know, who inspired them. Let's begin with God. Do you know that God himself commanded certain killings in the Old Testament? Remember, we're talking about the Old Testament times. Do you know that God himself actually commanded certain killings in the Old Testament times? For example, he commanded Israel to destroy certain hidden nations, killing all the women, the men, and sometimes every single living thing in those, in those places. 
We have an example with the Amalekites. He actually instructed Paul and Saul, which was really why Saul, King Saul, fell out of favor with God. Because God inspired him. God commanded him to go destroy Amalek, destroy the Amalekites, destroy, kill all the men, all the women, all the children, all the cattle, every single living thing. And of course, Saul disobeyed God and fell out of favor with God. So God under the old in the Old Testament times, actually commanded certain killings. Again, even under the law, he commanded, you know, um, stoning, killing as, you know, punishment for certain violations of the law. For example, under the law, if you if you worship an idol, or you committed adultery, or you committed murder, God actually commanded that such a person be killed by stoning. So we've seen that under the old covenant, God himself actually commanded setting killing. There's so many other examples. And then there were also killings that God himself, apart from commanding his people to do, actually executed by himself. There were killings that God himself executed under the old covenant. For example, God personally killed the first two sons of Judah you know, air and honor, because the, the Bible says they were wicked before God. And God himself killed them. Genesis 38, verses 7 and 8, you can read it. We can't read the scriptures because there are so many questions. Genesis 38, verses 7 and 8, God himself killed them. That's what the Bible says. And then we see other examples in the scriptures where God himself executed the killing. For example, he killed the firstborn um, of the children of Egypt. He killed all the firstborn children of the Egyptians. He did that himself, praise God. Again, he killed even his own, Korah, Datan, and Abiram, who led a rebellion against uh, Moses in the wilderness. The Bible says that God himself killed them, number 16, from the first to the last verse. But the uh, interest here is verses 32 and 33, number 16, verses 32 and 33, you can read that on your own. God himself kills them. He killed Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's son. And remember by this time, Aaron was a high priest because they offered strange fire to God. And the Bible says that, you know, a fire came out from God and killed them. So we've seen God either command a killing, inspire a killing, you know, um, in, in, in his children, or actually executed the killings himself. Many people think it's unthinkable that God himself will kill, especially with what we know about God, especially the picture of God that we have under the dispensation of grace. But when you read the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 39, look at what God says in Deuteronomy 32 verse 39. Deuteronomy 32 verse 39. Look at what God says. Hallelujah. He says, see now that I, even I am he, and there's no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So we've seen God under the old covenant either command, you know, a killing, you know, by his people or execute the killing himself. Praise God. Now, thank God for, thank God for, um, for grace. Thank God for the dispensation of grace because, well, under this dispensation, because Jesus has come, has paid you know the price on Calvary, shed his precious blood. The Bible says that God will now be merciful to our righteousness. Amen. God says, I'll be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 to 12. Verse 12 says, I will be merciful to your righteousness. Your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. Why? Because he put all our sins on Jesus Christ. Praise God. He put all our sins on Jesus Christ. Again, he says under the new covenant that we are vessels of mercy. Everyone who is in Christ Jesus, who, who put their faith in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, now is a vessel of mercy. God says we are now vessels of his mercy. Romans 9 verse 23. Hallelujah. Again, under the new covenant, God says that he will no longer impute sin on us. Why? Because he imputed all our sins on Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 4, verse 8. He says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Because God has imputed all our sins on Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 
Praise God. Now look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. The Bible says that, you know, to know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing upon them their trespasses, because he was imputing all our sins on Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, or the word of reconciliation. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, the Bible says that God made him to be seen who knew no sin, God imputed our sins on him. So under the new covenant, God is not imputing sin on us. He has imputed our sins on Jesus Christ. He made him to be seen who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now let's look at the killings that were either inspired by the devil or executed by the devil himself. Now there are quite a number of them in the Bible that you see clearly were inspired by Satan, by the devil. For example, the killing of Amnon by Absalom. It was the devil that inspired Absalom to kill his brother Amnon. Amnon. Of course, it was the devil. It wasn't God. And then again, of course, the, the, the killing of Abner by Joab. It was the devil that inspired Abner to, kill, to murder Joab in cold blood. It wasn't under, you know, um, under a, a, a battle environment. Again, it was the devil that inspired David to kill Uriah. The, the husband of Bathsheba, after he committed adultery with her to cover his trap. It was the devil that inspired David to commit that killing, okay? And we see so many, you know, other ones like that in the Bible. Again, we see the devil himself execute some of the ki killings in the Bible. For example, he was the one that killed the, the, the children of Job using the elements. He killed the children of Job. He didn't do it to any human being or human vessel. So to that question, who inspired the killings in the Old Testament? Some were inspired by God. Some were commanded by God. Some were executed by him. Some were commanded or inspired by the devil. Some were also executed by him. Praise God. Now question number three, it says, can a believer lose the Holy Spirit? Can a believer lose the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, our Lord Jesus answered that question. John 14, verses 15 to 17. Can a believer lose the Holy Spirit? John 14, verses 15 to 17. Look at what Jesus says. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, not temporarily, but forever. Now, who's this comforter? Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because he seared him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. So the question is, can a believer lose the Holy Spirit? The answer is no. As long as you're a believer, you can't lose the Holy Spirit. Now the question is, what makes a person a believer? Or what made you a believer? It was very simple. Your faith in the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ made you a believer. Praise God. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. What did it say? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Praise God. You become a believer. And what it means is that once you do this, it means that the Spirit of God now lives in you. you. You become a temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. He says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So as a believer, the Spirit of God lives in you. And as long as you believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are a believer. The Spirit of God will not leave you. You will not lose the Spirit of God. You may make mistakes. You may fall into sin. You may blow up things. You may even mess up your life. But as long as your faith is in the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are born again. The Spirit of God is in you. Praise God. You may grieve Him. You may limit Him. You may resist Him. You may even quench him, but you will never lose him as long as you are a believer. Praise God. And I tell you something, when you mess up, God can chastise you. God can chastise you big time. The Bible says no chastisement at the present time is joyous, but grievous. So when God chastises, 
it can actually produce grief. Another scripture says that whom the Lord loves, he chastises and scourges every son whom he receives. He receives. Scourging is not easy. Scourging is painful. Sometimes the chastisement of God will get you some pain, but you will never lose the Holy Spirit as long as you're a child of God, as long as you're a believer. Praise God. Hallelujah. Question number four. This one says, I've been asking God to heal me. Could there be a reason why he doesn't want to heal me? Wow, this is strong. Could there be a reason? He says he's been asking God to heal this, this person, has been asking God to heal them. And the question they're asking is, could there be any reason why God doesn't want to heal them? Well, let me answer this question by saying that the, the challenge is that you are asking when you should be receiving. Praise God. You're asking when you should be receiving. Why am I saying that? Because it's too late for God to refuse to heal you, even if he wanted to, because he already did. Praise God. He already did in Christ Jesus. He already healed you on the cross. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Peter 2.24. The Bible says that Jesus himself, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. Healing has already been done on the cross. So even if God wanted to change his mind, it's too late. So the challenge I think you have is that you're asking God to heal you when God is actually expecting you to receive the healing that he already provided for you through, through the cross of Calvary, through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now how did God do it? Matthew chapter 8, 8 verse 17, very clear. How did God heal you by the stripes of Jesus Christ on the cross? Matthew 8, 17 clearly reveals how he did it. Matthew 8, 17. Look at what it says here. Hallelujah. It says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Jesus himself took our infirmities and carried all our sicknesses. How did God do it? How did he heal you by the stripes of Jesus? He took every single one of your sickness, disease, weakness, and pain and put them on Jesus Christ. So you can walk in freedom. So you can walk in liberty. So God has already made provisions for your healing. He has already done it. The challenge is you need to know how to receive what has been given to you instead of asking God to come and heal you again. Every time you ask God to heal you, you are literally saying to God, take Jesus back to the cross. Let him go back and take those stripes. Because the Bible says by those stripes, you were healed already. The Bible says Jesus took all your sickness and disease and he put them on Jesus Christ. Praise God. So how do you receive your healing rather than ask God to heal you? How do you receive your healing? By faith, James chapter 1, verse 17, by James chapter 1, verse 7 says, Let not anyone think they can receive anything from God without faith. Let not anything anyone think that can receive anything, including healing, from God without faith. So, how do you receive your healing by faith? How do you receive the healing that has been given to you already, provided already by faith? Philemon 6. He says that the communication of your faith will be effectual, how? By the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus, including healing. So God says you receive your healing by faith, healing that has already been given in Christ, you receive it by faith by acknowledging that healing. Praise God. Hallelujah. So how do you acknowledge your healing? Number one, right believing. Number two, right confession. The right confession will produce the reality, will create the reality and release the power for the manifestation of the healing that has already been provided in Christ Jesus, has already been given in Christ Jesus, right believing, right confession, and right actions. The Bible calls it the spirit of faith. That's how you acknowledge your healing, so it can become your material or physical reality. It's already been settled. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, We all have the same spirit of faith as it is written. We believe, therefore, we, we spoke. We believe, therefore, have we spoken. So when you believe, right believing, then you speak, right confessions. You see, we can't be speaking sickness and disease and weakness and failure and defeat 
and expect that the healing that you know has been given to us in Christ Jesus, we can receive it. No. We can't receive what God has already done concerning our healing, you know, by talking sickness and disease and defeat and fear and failure. No. We need to begin to change our language. We need to begin to change, the, you know, the, the, the picture that we have of ourselves. You must begin to see yourself the way God sees you. Because as long as you are born again, every time God sees you, he sees a healed man. He sees a healed woman. Why? Because on the cross, he, he, he settled your healing. He took the sickness from you and put it on Jesus. So when he sees you, he sees, he sees a completely healed man, completely healed woman. Now healing, receiving the healing must begin by us seeing ourselves the way God sees us. Believe it. See yourself healed. Confess that you're healed and act like you're healed. Praise God. That's how you acknowledge your healing for the manifestation. Praise God. I hope this has answered um, your question, whoever it is. That um, you know, you know, ask this question. Praise God. Hallelujah. Number five. This question says, as a result of this pandemic, my family has been in deep financial crisis. How do I come out of it? I mean, this person needs practical solutions to come out of the you know financial crisis orchestrated by the the pandemic. Praise God. Now, I'll just say a few things quickly. Number one, believe that it is possible to come out of it. You have to believe that it is possible to come out of it. Because if you don't, you, 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 are, you haven't even started the journey to recovery. Believe that it is possible to come out of it. Mark chapter 9 verse 23, what did God say? He says, all things are possible to him that believes. All things, including financial recovery for you and your family, is possible if you believe. Number two, believe that it is the will of God for you to recover, for you to come out of it. How do we know? 3 John 2, that's what God says. He says, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. God wants you to recover into prosperity. Hallelujah. And then 2 um, Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, he says, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake and for my sake he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. So it tells you clearly that God wants you to walk in prosperity. Praise God. And actually went ahead and did something about it in Christ Jesus. Amen. So you have to believe that God wants you and your family to recover. Thirdly, be ready to obey the law of harvest for your finances. You must be ready to obey the law of harvest for your finances because faith is a law. And that's something that every one of us must know. Faith is a law. And there's something about laws. Laws operate by principles, like gravity operates by principles. So faith is a law. You must be ready to obey the law of harvest for your, for your financial miracle. Obey the law of harvest for your financial miracle. Why? Because the financial miracle you're looking for now is a harvest. Praise God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, you know, Genesis 8, God says, as long as the earth remains, the seed, time, and harvest will not cease. Amen? Verse 22. He says, while the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest, and cold, and heat, and summer, and winter, and day, and night will not cease. So you must be ready. This is the law that governs life here, that governs the kingdom. Praise God. You must be ready to obey the law of harvest for your financial miracle because the miracle you're looking for is a harvest and seed must go in before the harvest can come. That's what you know. this law says. There can be no harvest without a seed. The financial miracle you're looking for, the miracle you need to get out of this financial mess can only come by the seed you sow. It's the harvest you're looking for. But the harvest can only come when you put seed into the ground. It cannot come without a seed. And what seed are you going to sow? Or are you going to begin to sow by faith? Not by compulsion. Not by religion. Because many people say, but I've been sowing. I'm not getting anything. You may have been giving things, but not sowing. Sowing requires faith. You need to believe that what you're doing is according to the will of God. You need to believe that what you're doing will command the attention of God. You need to believe that what you're doing will produce the harvest that the word of God says 
it will produce. You have to sow the seed by faith. So what seed are you going to sow by faith? For the financial harvest you are looking for. Number one, the word of God in your mouth. Stop talking defeat and failure and poverty and loss. It is time to change your language. Begin to declare that Jesus became poor so that you become rich. That it is the will of God for you to succeed and be rich and be prosperous in the name of Jesus. Change your language. Put the word of God in your mouth. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 14 says, 12 14 says, A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. You want to be satisfied again financially. Put the word of God in your mouth. Praise God. Number two, the seed you must sow for the harvest you are looking for is your financial commitment. Amen? Tight on what you have now. No matter how small it is, don't wait until it becomes big. Tight from what you have now. And plant your seed. Give from where you are now. Tight from what you have now. Give from what you have now. Praise God. Your financial commitment is the second seed you must sow for the financial harvest that you're looking for. And then finally, be diligent in your work. Laziness is the seed for poverty. Be diligent in whatever your hand finds to do. From now, it doesn't matter how small it is, be diligent in it. And I tell you, it may not happen overnight because God is a God of process. But one thing is secure. When you begin to do these things, you will begin to recover from the financial mess. And very soon, you will enter into the overflow. Your testimony will change. Your story will change in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Question number six. Doctors say, I can't have children. What do I do? What do I do? First of all, examine the testimony of those who were in this same condition but received their testimonies. Whose stories changed? Even though at some point in their lives, they got the same report that you have now. And yet, their stories changed. Study their lives. Study the things they did so that it can inspire you to believe God for your story to change also. Study their lives. Praise God. And then, let's look at a few of them. The first one that may not have to do with children, but it will inspire you because the principles are the same. The woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 29 and read the Amplified Translation says that, you know, maybe we should read it. Mark chapter 5, verse 25 to 29. We read the Amplified Translation. Mark 5, 25 to 29. Mark 5, 25 to 29. Praise God. The Amplified Translation, this woman with the issue of blood. He said, and there was a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years and who had endured much suffering under the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but instead grew worse. She heard the reports concerning Jesus, and she came up behind him in the trunk and touched his garment. For she kept saying, take note of this, she kept saying, if I only touch his garment, hallelujah, I shall be restored to hell. She kept speaking, she kept saying, and immediately her flow of blood was dried up at the source, and suddenly she felt in her body that she was healed of her distressing Amen. Now, this woman had a, 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 you know, a, a bad report from the doctors. Amen. She had a report from the doctors, just like you did. But the Bible says she heard of Jesus, just like you're hearing now. She heard the word of God. And so she did four things. Number one, she heard. Number two, she believed. Number three, she kept saying that you know she was going to be, she was going to receive her healing. That she was going to make it. She was going to receive her healing. And then number four, she acted on her belief. She acted on what she believed. She went out and did something about, you know, her faith. Praise God. She went and touched the, 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 the garment of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now look at, look at Abraham. Abraham is a classical story of a man or someone who got a negative report or had negative symptoms and yet turned around and received the promise of God. So maybe, you know, maybe Abraham, Abraham's story will minister to you. The Bible says that, you know, we should look unto Abraham. Why? Because he, he, he becomes a clear example for you and I concerning the things we're talking about. Isaiah 51 verses 1 and 2 says we should look unto Abraham. Now, Abraham had two reports. Number one, the negative report that, you know, the symptoms in his body were showing that he couldn't have children 
or the doctors were given that he couldn't have children. Now the second report was God's report. God said to him, I don't care what the doctors have said. As long as I'm, I, I, I am God, I, I'm saying to you right now that you are the father of many nations. You are the, so your, your case is settled. And I, that's what God is saying to you. You're the one who asked this question. God is saying, I don't care what report you got from the doctors. Now I want you to know that you are the mother of many children. Praise God. You are the mother of many children. Hallelujah. Because it was part of what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary. Now, let's read Romans chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, and we'll see how Abraham, God is miracle, how he responded. Romans 4, verses 18 to 20. Romans 4, 18 to 20. Look at what the Bible says. It says, who against hope, believed in hope. That he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now when you look at it, you see the, the steps that led Abraham to his miracle. You see the way Abraham responded to the word of God that brought about the change in the situation from what the doctor said to what became his reality. Praise God. And that will be your testimony. So what did Abraham do? Number one, verse 18, he believed. Verse 19, number two, he acted on his faith. The Bible says he deliberately decided not to consider the symptoms anymore. He decided not to listen to the doctor's report anymore. He acted on his faith. And then number three, he kept confessing. The Bible says every time the devil said to him, you are not going to have children. The Bible says in verse 20, he gave glory to, to God. I can picture Abraham saying, look, God, I thank you for my children. Thank you because I'm the, the, the joyful mother of many children. Thank you because, Lord, I'm the joyful father of many children. Thank you because my family is full with children. The Bible says he kept giving glory to God. So you follow the steps and you will get your testimony in the mighty name of Jesus. Now a few more questions. We'll just take one or two and we close. This one says from a pastor. He says, we hear daily criticisms of men of God by fellow ministers or fellow men of God. Why is it so, sir? Is it part of the signs of the last days? Yes, it is. The enemy is sowing all of this to bring discord, to bring, you know, disunity, to devalue, you know, the, the, the work of the ministry and, you know, begin to cast aspersions on, you know, pastors. Well, of course, we know that there are pastors who are, you know, who are, um, who have abused the ministry, abused privileges. We know there are pastors who are not, you know, playing by playing by the by the rules, are not following the ethics of ministry. We know there are pastors who are not doing these things according to the word of God. But you know, <laughs> I can tell you something. They are also pastors who are playing by the rules. They are pastors who are following God, doing the will of God, abounding in their ministry. So we shouldn't criticize one another. If you have a problem with a fellow pastor, seek audience with that pastor and go talk to that pastor. Because when we criticize, we devalue the work we do. We give occasion for the enemy to speak derogatorily about the work of the ministry. And I can tell you something, God is not pleased about it. Praise God. Now, this, the other question says, the body of Christ of this age no longer works in love and oneness. Sir, what do we have to say about, you know, that sin that Jesus himself commanded his disciples to walk in love? Now, again, this is another attack of the enemy against the church. And Jesus said it, that one of the signs of the end times in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, he says, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold. That's what we're seeing. And unfortunately, it's happening in the church. And why is the enemy attacking the love work in the church? Because he knows that love is the power of the entire church. He knows that one of the things that will distinguish the church from the rest of the world in these last days is love. First John chapter 3, verse 10. That's what he says. He says, this is how the children of God will be distinguished from the children of the devil. Those who walk in love versus those who do not walk in love. That's why he's attacking the very essence of our identity in these last days. Praise God. 
Hallelujah. So we must go back to the place of love deliberately, intentionally, if we are going to be relevant to God in these last days. Number three, he says most churches are filled in the area of hospitality, which is supposed to be in the, the heart beat of God, especially in these last days. What do we do about it? Well, I think that part of the reason why we're not paying attention to hospitality is because we haven't fully come to understand the place of hospitality in the plan of God for these last days. You read First Peter chapter 4, verse 7 to 11. He says the end of all things is at hand. And then he begins to give instru instructions concerning the last days. The first one is, he says, you know, be sober, sobriety. Second one is prayer. The third one is love. The fourth one is hospitality. God says, use hospitality as a tool for the gospel in these last days. When we begin to understand that this is God's plan for the end, time, end times, we will begin to engage in hospitality. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, we, we can't take all the questions, but I'm sure that most of the questions have been answered, um, and I'm sure that God has spoken to you. Um, let's go back and you know think about these things and meditate on these things. I believe in my heart that testimonies will come out of this of this meeting. Testimonies will come out of this session. Your lives will not be the same again. I, I don't want to close the broadcast without giving someone an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. Maybe that's why you, you tuned in in the first place. You want to surrender your life to him. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart you died for me. On the third day, God raised you from the dead. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Should you want us to pray for you, pray with you, share a burden with you, share a testimony of the impact of this broadcast on your life or family, call any of the numbers on the screen at the end of the broadcast. Hallelujah. Till we meet again, keep walking by faith. Keep walking in this reality. Keep walking in the reality of who you are in Christ Jesus. Begin to live your life by the word, not by the circumstances around you. I love you. Your days of defeat are over. Your days of failure are over. Bye-bye.